I hope uh, everyone survived lunch. And, uh, it was very good. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Peter Thomas. Uh, Peter is, um, if I'm not mistaken, you're one of the sort of the early on original uh, age set of UMass graduates. Am I not right on that? All right, when UMass was. Uh, well, it was more than a, a twinkling in the father's or mother's eye, but it was, it was newly minted, let's say. And uh, Peter, I've always viewed Peter as uh, um, interested um, uh, in uh, North American archaeology, of course, but of the later period. And, you know, it's, it's nice. I'm interested in the later period, too. I just don't think I uh, pass any with the earliest stuff. But uh, Peter, I always look to Peter for ethno-historical data. Uh, I know Bruce Bork, uh, his colleague, uh, they share that interest. I'm sure he's going to give us an excellent talk. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a real uh, wonderful treat that uh, we have a scholar of his caliber uh, living in the valley. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, welcome to the Pleistocene. Uh, we saw uh, or heard an excellent presentation this morning. Dick Little gave uh, an overview of the geology of the Connecticut Valley. And you saw just the point where I'm going to take up. Um, what I want to do is really look at the transformation of the valley from the time that Lake Hitchcock burned. It's massive, and it's something that I hope I can give you a kind of a visual image of. I'm going to talk about the area of Turnus Falls first, and then I'm going to talk about a project I worked on in Vermont with uh, deltas into the Champlain Sea and the landscape transformation. Could you speak a little bit or put the mic closer to your mouth? Thank you. How close? Am I in your Better. view? Am I close? Okay. Like a lolly. Yep. Um, then I want to look at uh, Dedic or the Deerfield site and landscape transformation. And then I'm going to shift you to Alaska to look at a very young river system and the implications of that river system and the geology, related geology, to what the earliest changes in the landscape here uh, in the valley might have looked like. Boy, let me jump twice. Okay, so, all right, so here's the, here's the area. Um, we, we, Dick Little showed you this peninsula this morning with the plunge pools, this is uh, Turnus Falls and the, and the dam here, the Connecticut River coming down from the Oldfield, does a bend, goes down through a very narrow uh, portion of the valley. This is the mouth of the Deerfield River and going on down. And we talked about Glacial Lake Hitchcock and there's some wonderful maps out in the lobby. Uh, showing the distribution, the, the boundaries of the, the glacial lake in the bottom. Uh, Dick Little talked about the deltas into Lake Hitchcock uh, with the top set and the four set beds. You remember those in the Sandy Deltas? Okay, so looking at this area a little more closely, I couldn't get this thing to close, but basically this, 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 and everything in the blue is the top of a delta that was flushed out through the Millers River system into Glacial Lake Hitchcock, which is sitting here. And this is, I'm going to use metrics, 102 feet, 102 meters above sea level. 
uh, 300, 300, 305 feet, somewhere there. So when the glacial lake drains, everything from here to over there is under sand. Because the glacier, the lake itself, has been collecting the sediment that is feeding into this valley for several thousand years. Now at the bottom of that sequence, you remember we talked about varf clays this morning? Those really thin layers of clay? Those sit on the bottom of the valley, on the lake bottom. And those date from a time when the river systems are not flushing all that sand into the system yet. Okay, this is a still lake. So there's water coming into it, but it freezes in the wintertime and melts in the summer, and the silt is floating out into the lake and the clay, and it's settling to the bottom. So at the bottom of that sequence, we have these stratified layers of silt and clay. The last part of the equation comes then when the system begins to flush out much coarser material, actual sand. And you see that being dumped into the Deerfield Valley. And you remember we talked about the shoreline for the, deer, for the uh, lake sediments being up where we are and showed you that eroded level of flat land that was along the Pocumpec Range, that's the bottom of the lake here. And the bottom of that lake then continues all the way down south. So, what happens though is the lake drains, but the river is still there. So how does the river, what does the river do, and how long does it take it to do it? And that's basically what I'm talking about now. We saw this earlier on, and we see what essentially amounts to a river. The river's coming down, hits this bedrock sill, goes over it, creates waterfalls, and the, the current or the channel at that point is over in here. And it's going around and down through uh, the river system. Stay there. All right. So here's a, here's a three-dimensional view of this looking from the same uh, perspective. So what do we have here? I've drawn a cross-sectional line here. So we're at, 300, we're at 100 meters here. We're at 100 meters here. We're at 90 meters down here. We're at 100 meters up in here. This was the bottom of the lake. The river since then has gone from here to here. All right. Okay, so here's the cross section. Lake bottom, lake bottom, current river. And then the question is, well, how long did it take the river, which was originally at this level, to get to here? Now, one of the things that, uh, to give you an idea of the magnitude of that transformation, I calculated the volume of sediment from here to here that that river had to move to get from here to here. Anybody want to take a guess in the order of magnitude? Okay. That's my son. He's been reading my notes. 80, 89 million cubic yards. 
in a one mile stretch of the river. If you want to visualize that and take a 10 yard dump truck and fill them all and stretch them end to end, it'll go from here to Manchester, New Hampshire. 84 miles. That's a lot of dirt. And that's what happens throughout the Connecticut Valley. So when you talk about landscape change, the order of magnitude is huge in that post-drainage period. And as I'll try to point out, most of that occurred in about 3,000 years, not the 14,000 that we heard about this morning. Just a bit of a reflection. This is the Matanuska River drainage in Alaska. This drainage comes out of active, an active glacier, uh, out of a valley that looks much like this. I'll show you pictures of that uh, later on in the sequence. But what you see is the same thing. This was the bottom of, a, of outwash deposits. The river has cut down through this. Think of this as gill, think of that as Turner's Falls. What we don't see in New England very easily is the fact that our landscape is covered with woods or it's built up. But if we were really to take the trees away, we would see landscapes like this in New England. But the other thing I want to bring out is look at that river and look at the valley bottom. Is it an incised river as we're familiar with looking at the Connecticut River? No, it's a braided channel. It's a braided system. And that's what happens in young rivers and that's what I'll come back to later on in, in the end. So what I'm gonna suggest is in the early period of down cutting, is in a river system that looks like that. And only later do we get a river system that looks like this. And that makes a tremendous difference in terms of the landscape as well. Because basically, when you go from side to side, whatever wasn't initially within that braided system, gets left as the lake bottom. Anything within that system from the lake, from the edge of the lake that was cut to the cut on the other side of the valley has gone through that transformational process. So if you take your two valley edge boundaries of where that system began to cut, anything within those two boundaries is younger than that initial cut. And that has implications for archaeological sites because they shouldn't be there. If it's, as, as the river is cutting down lower and lower, it's moving its valley shallow, wide, narrower and narrower. And so by the time we get to the late woodland period, most of the occupations can be anywhere because all of those different landforms have been exposed. So think about lake bottom, only where the initial lake bottom has survived are we going to find the earliest sites or above the lake. But within the valley bottom, it's going to be from where that river began the first cut back towards what was not lake, what was above the original lake bottom. So when we, um, when the rivers down cut into this configuration with a single channel, then we begin to get terraces that develop 
adjacent to the channels. And these become often the sites of occupation. And in Turner's Falls, let's see if I put the next one is here. By the time that we hit the earliest European occupation in New England, at the time of King Philip's War and the fight at Riverside Falls, up until 1795 when they built the first dam on the Connecticut River, that's what Turner's Falls Dam or the Turner's Falls used to look like. So we have in the background plunge pools. We have the Relic River Channel that's filled in. We have, this is now Riverside. This is now underwater. The falls were never a falls as if you came through and dropped straight down a waterfall like Niagara Falls. It was a series of rapids and smaller falls for about a thousand feet with a huge flume running down through one side of it with water just roaring down through there. This little piece of the island still exists. There was a, apparently a patch of low floodplain here that's totally washed away now. And, the and right now there's a bridge that goes across from here, across from Turner's Falls to Gill. So that's the transformation that we're looking at. And the transformation that we must keep in mind when we're dealing with archaeological resources. Where are we going to find them? Where have they survived? Where's the most likely places to go look? So just to reiterate, this is a map from uh, the 1894. You can actually see the relic channel in here. And this is, right here there's a little rise where you can see it here. This is Barton's, um, Burton Island. The reason I bring up Burton Island is that Burton Island is actually made up of varved clays. So we know that that's the, this is the bottom of the sequence. And the river didn't cut, cut through down some of those varved clays, but the varved clays are pretty tough things. And then you have the bedrock and the falls, and so that those falls have maintained that same level for thousands of years. So 1894, the dam, and then they've raised the dam uh, twice since then. So this is what it looks like today. And then I'm going to shift into this area because the question is, what's the rate of downcome? So just a, an overview: um, the submerged land. You can see the old channel. The the, the this was all submerged, or open land back 150 years ago. Um, we're going to focus here. There's two archaeological projects that I worked on. Um, one back in 1975 and one back in 1979. Um, the WEMCO site stands for Western Massachusetts Electric. That was the company that owned this uh, particular um, piece of land here. And then I did an uh, archaeological survey for a wastewater treatment system uh, in 78, 79 uh, through Gill so that we actually had uh, test units all the way down these streets and back and forth and down through here. The important thing for our study, though, is the archaeological sequence, which you got at, at Wemco. We dug 13 5 by 5 foot units. Uh, all together, so we're in an area maybe the size of the stage here. Not very big. It keeps jumping. Oh, anyway, so what we get is 
a sequence of archaeological deposits dating from approximately 7,800 years ago all the way up to the point of European contact. The soil is four to five feet thick. It's coal black from all the organic remains that were left at this site. And the reason for it is, and you've seen pictures going back, is those falls were one of the most significant fishing sites uh, on the Connecticut River for migrating um, anadromous fish, shad, salmon, alewives, eel, and a few other things that would help to navigate those falls. And it drew people from wide areas uh, to that particular spot every spring. So you've got continuous occupations, one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other, but over time building up enough sediment in there to actually build some depth. So at the bottom of it, we have what we call uh, Neville and Stark points, the Neville ones being on the, um, yeah. with a particular stem here and this, these notches and then start points being more, the more pointed uh, points at the, at the bottom. And these make up about the bottom uh, 12 to 15 inches of the sequence. So what the implication of that is then that this is, Wemco is a terrace upon which people are living as early as 7,800 years ago. So think about the lake drains at 10.8 by 78. The river is already almost in its present location in terms of depth. So within 3,000 years, that river has eroded away 100 feet of sand and lacustrian clay. That's a huge volume of material and a huge change in the landscape. I'm just going to briefly go through if some people just like to look at points. I apologize for the fact that these date to 1975, um, but you, if you recognize the points, you've got um, these are some of the Otic Greek kind of stuff, Vosburg, Brewertons, small stem points. Uh, some of the, a couple of terminal archaic ones down through here. These are our equivalent in this section of the Connecticut Valley of the Orient fishtails. They tend to be, Orients tend to be more like this, but we've got a broader stem variety. And then we're going into some of the middle woodland stuff here and then the late uh, woodland Nevada Madison type points here. In those 13 squares, we took, I think there's something like 126 projectile points. Uh, so you get a, a sense of the volume of material. Uh, as well as uh, scrapers and drills and uh, part of an axe, uh, part of a net stone, um, part of a gorget down here. This is a slate knife. And down towards the bottom, well, we're going to jump then up a terrace. If we go back up the stream, I don't think, I don't want to go all the way back to the map, but just going back away from the river, the, str the street's going up, and it hits another terrace. And so in the um, survey for the wastewater treatment plant, this is what we hit at the base of the sequence in, in a test pit next to Walnut Street. And you can see the number of cobbles and stuff that are at this depth. And you remember the pictures I showed you of the terraces that were beginning to form. So we know we're getting towards the bottom of the sequence. And in here we have an 8,650 year old date. So 
we're almost a thousand years older and we're only back up one terrace. So now we've got a hundred years of erosion in 2,000 years, not three. And there's another terrace and then there's a, <clears throat> then you hit a hillside. But we, one of the things that I learned doing archeology span for 40 years in New England is you have to learn to read that landscape. And sometimes terraces are pretty evident. You may have, you know, enough jump, a drop from me to the floor to actually see a terrace front. When you start getting into the modern era, the differences in elevation of terraces may be two to three feet. And if you don't have a good surface view of changes in the landscape, you'll never pick them up. <coughs> Just quickly, fish is the predominant thing, but we also found uh, these species in the, in the pits. These are levels. Boy. The, the, this area up in here, these are in inches. You gotta remember, we didn't go metric in this country, and that for only a very short period of time. But most archaeologists today talk about meters, centimeters. That's how we lay out our pits, because we were actually mandated by Congress to do it somewhere in the 60s. I can't even remember when. But this was pre 60s so uh, we're all working in feet. So, but basically, that's the, the depth, 40, uh, 45 inches, and these are some of the cultural features, um, but fish fragments, fish vertebra particularly, and also something called a proatic bulla, which is it's a little round bone in the interior of a salmon, or of a skull, of a fish. And uh, in uh, shad, um, they, when they, heads went into the cooking pits, those things became calcined. And there's two per fish. So you can actually get, figure out a fish count in a feature by counting the number of proatic bullets divided by two. I don't think we'll go through a lot of this stuff. I just figured I'd throw it in quickly because people haven't seen this in 40 years. Well, it doesn't seem to want to get me. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now for the comparative stuff, just so we're not looking at some anomaly in Turner's Falls, just to see what happens. So I'm going to go up to Highgate, the Missisquoi River in Highgate, Vermont. Um, if you remember your early geography, uh, you remember that the Atlantic Ocean at that point had come down the St. Lawrence Seaway and had inundated the Champlain Valley and everything west of Ottawa. It was a 20,500 square mile inland sea called the Champlain Sea with whales and seals and three pine spine sticklebacks and a, a few other things there and early paleo hunters coming into that environment as well. Uh, as Mike said today, we have uh, paleo Indian sites beyond the maximum limits of the Champlain Sea and within the limits of the Champlain Sea. So there's transformations over time. There's three sets of deltas. As the sea went down, the deltas moved further and further out into the water and left relic deltas behind. So what the study site I'm going to show you is, I'll well, just leave it at that. Um, there's a delta top here at about 300 feet above sea level. And that extended for miles out through here. And then if uh, you're familiar with the archeological literature, the Reagan site, which was one of the first Paleo-Indian sites ever identified in the Northeast by Bill Ritchie, actually sits up on a hillside higher than the Delta Tops. 
And then what we see is the, the Missisquoi River, just like the Connecticut River, has eroded from the delta top down to its present course. This uh, elevation right here is at about 180 feet above sea level. So we've gone from 310 to 180. Same order of magnitude as Turner Falls. I worked an uh, extensive number of sites along this section of the river system and had a backhoe trench uh, that ran from the river back into the terrace sequence. There's a terrace here, there's a terrace top here, there's a terrace here, and you can see some of the terraces left earlier up from here. The thing with the trench is that what we find is when you get down and you dig a trench below the water table, logs survive. We have a series of dated logs between 1,100 and 8,000 years ago that actually mark the river banks as that river has moved from the interior terraces out towards its present location. And we find in some instances that river is moving at 100 feet a century, uh, at 10 feet a century, and we find that there are other uh, time periods when it moves about three feet in 2,000 years. We're looking at major climatic changes over this course of time. So keep that in mind. If you're looking for archaeological sites and trying to develop archaeological models, you have major climatic changes going on at the same time that you have huge landscape changes. Each one of those climatic changes is going to bring new fauna, new flora, new distributional patterns, new things for people to uh, accommodate to. And then, not only do we have, um, so here's your, your 310 down to 180. All of that's formed by 8,000 BP. And I also have archaeologic uh, dates from cultural features, an early archaic feature with a 7,900 BP date sitting on top of the one, two, third terrace. So this sequence, and then it was, this is on top of this terrace that, this is the bottom log, and this is the occupation. So we're right close to the end of that terracing sequence. And then I've got them, uh, we have extensive woodland period sites through here. But the point is that it's done this amount of incising in two to 3,000 years. All right, now, I just thought for the heck of it, I don't know why this thing keeps going. Okay, so we're back to Connecticut Valley. Uh, we're somewhere in here. This is Mount Sugarloaf down here. This is the Dedic or Deerfield site. What are we calling it now? Sugarloaf. Sugarloaf site. Uh, it's right about here. And the Connecticut River. And right below the um, Deerfield site is, or right adjacent to it, is a very sharp drop-off of about 35 to 40 feet. And at the bottom of it, one would think, oh, okay, I've got to have a river. Something's got to erode this valley bottom. Okay, so we're starting with a lake bottom here, and something got into the lake bottom and started to cut, cut it down. So this is what you see today. You see the, the, the site, the agricultural fields. We have, now one of the things that I'm using 
is uncalibrated radiocarbon dates. So when Mike was talking about calendar dates today, add 2,000 to these dates. Because radiocarbon dates do not, when you say 8,000 years ago in terms of radiocarbon dates, that doesn't mean you go from now 8,000 years back and you've got a calendar date. There's a, there's a curve in terms of the translation. So we're, we're back then to, what was it, 12-8? Somewhere around that, uh, D, or dear? 12-4. 12-4, okay. So anyway, the, the point is, this is the late one. Now, here's the, here's the escarpment. And there is a relic channel down through here. The significant part of that is we have a radio uh, a radiocarbon date from that channel sequence of 9,300 years ago. So we're not very far along after the lake bottom is abandoned. So from here to the other side of the valley, everything archaeologically and everything landform-wise is going to be younger than this. This is the first step in that downcutting process. As we move this way, if you were to go out there, you'd see terrace after terrace after terrace after terrace getting lower and lower and lower and lower. And in that process, this river has then moved from here to here to here to here, cutting away what was ever here and here and here. It's eroded all of that residual stuff that was over here. And when you start looking at the valley in its longer extent, you see it's gone from side to side to side to side, leaving terraces as it got slightly lower and lower, and only stops down cutting when it hits bedrock sills. When it hits bedrock that it cannot go into, it stops its downward movement and starts that lateral movement. And it's that transition that really becomes important in terms of thinking about the early stage of valley development and the later stages. Because they're not, they're, I believe they're different. Back this way? Sorry, back which way? <laughs> well, I've been pointing them. Or the computer for one or the other. Well, let's try this. Mr. Hitchcock, where are you? <laughs> Okay, so here's my cross section. And the same thing as Turner's Falls. Uh, going from one side of the valley to the other. I'm a little bit lower. Uh, the Sugarloaf site's up here, but it's the same landform. Okay? Same cut. <clears throat> now, here's your cross section. Bottom of Lake Hitchcock. In the red. Pre-19... Uh, 9300 BP fluvial channel, there's some kind of channel deposit, there's some kind of channel that was in here, that was there, then was abandoned, filled in with organics, and those who overdated. So the channel itself is 
pre 9,300. And then a series of younger alluvial terraces. You can see them down across the valley floor here. So, give me back one. Yeah, I'm going to take you to Alaska. This is a young river system that is in the process of formation. Um, it originates in a flow of active glacial ice that runs down through here and then flows uh, into uh, a large bay. Anchorage is uh, well, down here somewhere. Um, very steep mountains, but uh, actively fed. Go ahead. You can see it here. This is the glacial front. It's coming down this valley. And it's full of debris and stuff um, dumping into the river system down here. Go ahead. You can see the down cutting that has gone into this valley. These are sandy bluffs. It's already gone through 100, 100 feet of sand and the river systems down here in the valley bottom. You can see some of the outwash sands here but it's cutting down through. These are the same kind of sands that you're seeing in Turnus Falls. That, that delta that filled that whole valley bottom. But look at the river. Whoops. Look at this not single stream, but braided streams from one side of the valley to the other. And this stream is about 80% the width of the Connecticut Valley in the cross section at Deerfield. So we're not looking at a small stream that's braided this way. We're looking at something pretty extensive. This is a topographic map of that section of stream. Um, you can see, particularly here, the extent of the braiding, these channels. And every year they're going to change. But they don't change in the sense, well, they do. About every year they change. Because one of the things that's true for a river like this is the streams are about this deep. <coughs> You've taken the water that's in a deep single channel stream and allowed it to dissipate over a two mile stretch so that the channels themselves are shallow, but they're moving a lot of sediment. So my question to myself was, well, what did, go ahead, oops, let's go back, maybe back a couple, keep going. Okay, next, okay, so this is what it looks like from an aerial photograph. You see a lot of those channels are kind of obscured because it's changed from the time the map was made to when the photograph was taken. It gives you a sense of how rapid things move within the system. That's the same location as the map I just showed you. Go ahead and put the next one on. What I want to suggest is that at the time, for the first couple, for the first thousand years anyway, after the glacial lake drained. The Connecticut River system looked like this. And it cut from one side of the valley to the other. It was not a single channel stream. I wanted, there's a number of implications for this. One is that the Connecticut River was not an obstacle to movement. You can walk across the Connecticut River. 
that period when the Paleo Indians are here, this is what the Connecticut Valley looked like with a wide braided system, not a deep channel and adjacent terraces. And that I think presents a different perspective when you're looking at what's going on in terms of paleontology. You've got a whole different river bottom and a whole different valley system than you had before, than you had conceptually with a single chain. So that's really where I want to end it because it's these kinds of um, considerations that I think need to go into the planning process and the discovery process and the interpretive process. Now, I said to Mike earlier on, I'd give him a, a fifth alternative for the, the fluted point uh, in Northampton. If I'm correct, then it's highly unlikely that there's any in-place site related to that fluted point. Because at the point where the fluted point was made, that land didn't exist. It was still buried in the sub, it, the river hadn't cut down to that level yet to form the terraces where the point was found. We'll see. Go ahead. And that brings up the question of the Northampton Airport Strip. You, you, you found field trip with me. And the Connecticut River once ran parallel to that airport strip, but now it's meandered a half a mile towards the Is the strip the bottom of the lake? Is, 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 is that the lake? That's the lake bottom? That's correct. So, so we have to up that Bridge Street, that tire, that dumpy tire station, has that classic <coughs> wedge to where the paleo, where Jason found his paleo point. It's, it's definitely a wedge going into like what you're showing here, like an estuary of whatever. Okay. Well, I think that, that I mean, what I would suggest then is think about this model relative to the landscape that you're seeing there today. I think it's a different kind of model and a very useful model. But we've seen it throughout New England. I've just given you an example from Vermont. You've got a couple of examples from the Connecticut Valley. You're going to find that transformation in every major river system in New England. Anything north of Long Island, the, there's a Ronkonkoma moraine that runs the length of the, down the center of, of Rhode Island. That's the glacial front, the maximum southern limit of the glacier. And as that glacier moved further and further and further back up north, it's forming glacial lakes, it's got a, a pro-glacial lakes, it's, uh, but and then you've got these major lakes like the Lake Hitchcock. But you can follow the terraces and the lake bottoms going up 91. If, if you know what to look for, you can see that lake bottom on the valley edge getting further and further and further north. And everything from that, flat, that flat, nice flat valley edge feature down was formed after that lake drained. So, I'll leave it there. Any questions? Yes? Braided rivers are formed when the river carries more sediment than it can deal with. And so that's why it starts to meander all over the place. Uh, in the pictures you showed, you showed glaciers. Hello? Uh, in, in the photographs you showed glaciers uh, with the graded streams immediately in front. So the glaciers were supplying this excess of sediment. But in the case of draining of glacial Lake Hitchcock, it had been there for many thousands of years before it drained. So the ice front was now back up in Montreal or somewhere like that. 
So I'm wondering if the, the river that formed on the base of the glacial lake Hitchcock would have been overloaded with sediment to produce a braided system. Well, it's carrying, it's going to be carrying all that loose sediment, all the delta sediments and stuff in there. The other thing that I think is going to come into play here, when I go through the geology uh, for the Lake Hitchcock, um, uplift apparently occurred after the lake drained. So at the point where that erosion is going to, when the, when the system's forming and the, the, road, the, the river's coming down, you've essentially got a flat plain from Turner's Falls to Merritt and Connecticut. And so it's not going to be able to transport much in the way of, of sediment. It's not going to be, it's not going to have a slope sufficient to incise into a single channel. Otherwise, we'd have the, a river that looked like the glacial one that was there because with two steep-sided edges, because it would just incise and and couldn't go any further once it incised that far. I think we, we're dealing with it's 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 almost like a flat plane that's been loaded with deltas delta egg material and it's trying to get through that and so it's carrying a lot of sediment along with the water that's coming out of the drainage out of the mountains but the glaciers well to the north do you know if there's any data on the suspended sediment load of the Connecticut River today and whether that load would be sufficient to do the amount of erosion that you showed take, took place in terms of all In other words, do you have to have an exceptionally high uh, erosion rate then, or is the sediment load that the Connecticut River now carries sufficient to be able to cause that erosion back then? I don't have the data. Um, I, you know, a really good question. I, I think what, what my gut reaction would be is it does not today, simply because we have a forested landscape, and at the time we're talking about, there's no forests. We're talking about a tundra, a tiger, or something or other with scattered woodlands around some marshes and that sort of thing, but not the, the landscape. And, and that woodland ties up a huge amount of moisture from rains, from melted snows, from whatever, uh, that, and then you get the transpiration into the atmosphere. So the amount of moisture in the system, I think, is going to be a lot different than that it was now. Uh, Peter, are we on? Yes. Yeah, you're on. Peter, I, I, I think you're right in your interpretation of what the <coughs> Connecticut Valley in this area looked like after the lake drained. However, I don't think the river is carrying or transporting or moving much sediment. It's simply a braided stream system on this flat plain. Flat plain. Where the sediment transport is happening is down toward Long Island. In other words, you've got to have headward erosion of this soft sediment within the river valley itself before the stuff up here will start to move. It's much like Niagara Falls is eating its way backward through rock. Yep. The Connecticut River had to eat its way backward through sediment in order to develop the current meandering pattern from side to side. Probably it was, you know, a shallow braided system easily crossed. Okay. But the, the transport was elsewhere until the river ate its way back to here. Yeah, and I think it starts the, if I understand the process is we've been talking about a single time for Lake Hitchcock, but the glacial movement back begins early. We're still well under ice 3,000 years after it starts moving backwards. So there's some of that downcutting already happening by the time Lake Hitchcock actually forms in Merritt. So we're, we're, we've dropped some there. I think the other variable is going to be where are the bedrock sills here, and it's at South Hadley. It's, it's at that point where 
the, the Mount Tom and it's the Hoyoke Dam. The Hoyoke Dam. Yeah. yeah. And so once that begins there, then you're going to have that back cutting. And, and I think that's where I'm, well, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly, but if we've got terraces formed next to the river by, oh, I would say 9,000 BP, and the lake, in, in that terminology, the lake goes out in 10, in 1,500 years, it didn't take too long, but it, it, there's a real difference between the terraces here and the river. Anybody else? Yeah. Nope. Oh, where? Yeah. Can, can you give us a feeling for what occurred during the drainage? What, was it a catastrophic event? Was it a gradual event? How, how great a period of time did it occur over? I'm trying to remember the geological literature. <laughs> it's not my... Uh, within a couple of hundred years, there's a several stages of it going. It didn't go out in one fell swoop. Um, the dam breaches is off to a side. It drops some, the lower ends in the in Connecticut drain. Then there's some drainage up here. This this section, I believe, lasted perhaps 50 to 100 years longer than the next section downstream. Still a very short period of time. A fairly short period of time. Um, but leaving this, you know, nice relatively flat glacial lake bottom uh, for, for occupation, for mastodons, for whatever. Um, ben, you okay? Yeah, I, I was just wondering whether it was like a third of it, a third of it, a third of it, or if it was more or less one it, of it. It doesn't seem to be because there's some beach lines relic as it kind of dropped. Um, I, I don't believe it was catastrophic. One of the things that I'll, I'll throw in here, you remember the plunge pools? At some point, the third plunge pool, the lowest one where the current channel goes through, there's a stratigraphic break in the sequence at Wemco. Um, somewhere around 6,000 years ago where the artifact density really drops off in this three inch level. And I'm wondering if it isn't right about that time that you get that final breach and that river just goes rushing through, carrying everything in front of it, gets even up onto the riverside terrace and lays in this layer of sand. And then the rest of the sequence continues on up through. But, um, that's the only kind of catastrophic thing that I can think of. Oh, hands all over the place. Yes, Al. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out when Lake Hitchcock goes down, when the water disappears, and you said that the land raises up. And what is causing that underneath is to make that land come up? Okay. It's called glacial rebound and a crustal rebound. And essentially think of it as this. At some point we got a mile and a half of ice over us. That's a few pounds of ice. <laughs> think of the earth as a basketball. Take your two thumbs, push on the basketball. You're applying pressure, that's the poundage. Take your thumbs away and the basketball pounce, bounces back. Now, Admittedly, it didn't come back in a half a second, but that's the concept. So that the reason you have the Champlain Sea in the Champlain Valley and all the way west to Ottawa is the same process. The weight of that glacier had to press the St. Lawrence Lowland below the level of the Atlantic Ocean. And when the glacier receded north of the St. Lawrence River, the Atlantic Ocean just poured into that huge depression and filled it up with seawater. And the whales came in and the seals came in and people came in. But 
the rate of rebound was more rapid in the beginning and slowed as we get to the present. But the, the rebound is still going on at about a half an inch a century now. It rebounded more to the north than it did to the south. So if you're in Vermont, for example, in the Champlain Valley, you can find the deltas in the Champlain Sea, like the one I showed you at 320, 310 feet above sea level. If you get out to Middlebury, it's at about 2, 220. It's about five feet a mile. And the reason that the delta top is at 100 meters above sea level in Turnus Falls, that's the lake bottom, okay? The lake bottom in South Deerfield is about 60 meters above sea level. And the difference being rebound. Our, our underground water systems uh, have to uh, affect that rebound? To Not to the extent that we're talking about. We're, ta we're talking about from the core or from the outer mantle up. The, the, the water systems you're talking about are this thick compared to something that's, that's like that. But they will definitely be affected. I mean, a lot of our aquifers are the result of glacial sands and gravels that have now been uplifted so that the water drains laterally instead of laying flat. Peter, this is a critical point. Uh, your 10,800 rated carbon year date for the late grant, where did that come from? Probably out of my head. That, that's not a that's not a calibrated date. That's a and that's where, where's Bud over there? What did you tell me? Didn't you tell me twelve eight? The draining a lake. What we did was we went with seventeen thousand years when it became Mormon, and it had been drained by thirteen thousand years. So for about four thousand years, the lake process began filling and it ended. It drained. Okay, and but the difference is that uh, I'm using uncalibrated dates with 2,000 years younger. Yeah, uh, in my talk, I mentioned there are some OSL dates that were reported in 2006 as large standard errors on it, but they indicate roughly 13, but could be 13.5, could be. Okay. Well, let, let's put, let's just put it this way: <laughs> it was earlier than when the river down started down cutting, but the process, uh, the I guess it's, it, the older you push it, the less magnitude, but there's still a huge chain transformation. Yeah, I think it still needs to be resolved. The relationship of the Turner Falls Airport, is it the same as the... The uh, same delta the top. This, there was no particular uh, ceremonial it, significance to to that area as opposed to on the other side of the river? That's what we've all been told through the local... I, well, I can't... Uh, that's a cultural question rather than a geology question. I mean, the, the airport is sitting on the top of the delta. And so that's the, that's the area that was a, into which the, the present river has eroded. But it doesn't say anything about... The, the, the significance, the cultural significance of that particular landform. That's a, that's a different different issue, I think. Now, during the draining stages, is there any evidence to suggest that it refilled at all during, no? No, because of the lake? Yes. No, I don't believe so because it was the dam, the natural dam in Meriden that held the water back. So you'd have to have a process that rebuilt the dam that held the water back, and I don't see any evidence of that. Right. I was thinking the one process that could exist, we've seen in smaller 
uh, stages as ice dams building up in between Mount Holyoke and Mount Tom? Uh, perfectly possible with ice dams as long as the weather is cold enough to keep it frozen 12 months of the year, you can hold it back. But otherwise, you'd simply have a seasonal um, block. And it's also going to be, the ice dam is going to be confined to that area that's fed by the river. And once that river begins to incise, it's going to be in a much narrower channel, so there's not going to be a broader um, dam to block up the lake, the area that was once a lake. Well, I think I've I, I, I would like to <clears throat> ask a question. I have not seen it, so can you describe what it looks like in Rocky Hill, where the dam was supposed to have, where the dam was? Never been that, there. That made Lake Hitchcock. <laughs> and what about all the sediment there? Did that ever wash down? What is there now? If we took a flight over Rocky Hill, where the dam was. What would we see now? What, what's, what's left? Is there something that's a high thing that you would? Uh, well, when you play for my, when you pay for my helicopter ride, I'll let you know because I've never seen it. Yes. So if, if the point that Jason found is Yeah, I mean, it, 12, it's, a, it's a wonderful point. Oh, the, I guess where I was going with that is I, I like Mike's first possibility, the heirloom, because what we, what we have found over time is people going into older sites and getting material and using it. But instead of the grandfather or the father or whatever ever leaving that behind as a, as a marker. Maybe his great, 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 great grandfather made it. But it's an exceptional item. And I think in that sense it, um, assumes a cultural value that far transcends simply the fact that it's an artifact that somebody picked up. It's just, why do we collect things? We collect things of beauty. It doesn't have to have great value necessarily. This happens to be something that was of great beauty that was made by man. And I'm thinking one of the possibilities is simply somebody found this, and if they did leave it intentionally, it had a, it had a message. It had a meaning, but I'm not sure it's related to an occupation nearby. If it's in a landform that is too young for that occupation to occur, um, and, and I, I think we need to look at that transition in the whole valley, and then start comparing. Well, what time period of sites do we find on what? terraces and how far back can we go? Because the younger the site, the greater the area of occupation that's going to be left. Because it's that wedge in the middle that's been eroded away by the river cutting down and down and down. Okay, I've well gone over my time. <laughs> yeah.